Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me again uh, to Genesis. But before we read some in Genesis chapter 25, I'm going to read to you um, Hebrews chapter 11. I know I have, I have personally enjoyed walking through the life and the adventure of Abraham as we have together over the past several weeks. Um, but, but now we kind of bring his, uh, Abraham's life comes to a close uh, here on earth. Um, but we're going to read uh, the writer of Hebrews, how he kind of summed up uh, Abraham in chapter 11, starting in verse number 8. If you would please stand with me as we uh, read this together. Verse number 8 and following says, By faith Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith he made his home in the promised land, like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, Abraham, even though he was past age, and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to become a father because he considered him faithful, who had made the promise. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for what we have been able to learn uh, your truth, the principles that we have found from the life of Abraham, how he lived, and as we'll see today, he died in faith. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be attentive, that we would hear your still small voice, and we would know exactly what it is that you want us to do. Father, I pray for myself that you would cleanse me, and God, that you would use me as your mouthpiece today. God, we thank you in advance for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Um, the title this morning is Looking Back and Also Looking Forward. And um, how many of y'all have ever been to a track meet? You may have been to a track meet before, at least seen it on TV. Well, it's kind of spread out if you've been to one live, and you can't really see every uh, event happening up close because there's such a distance and different areas they're doing that in. But one event that I always appreciate to watch is the relay race. Do you know what I'm talking about? You have maybe four runners, and uh, the first runner, it's a sprint. When the gun goes off, it's a sprint. And the other teammates on his team are spaced out across the track. And uh, when that gun goes off, that first runner, he sprints to the next runner. Well, the next runner, as, the, as the, his teammate is approaching, he's looking back, He's looking back, and then he starts jogging, and then he starts to pick up his pace, and he holds his hand back. And the other runner is running as fast as he can, and they pass that baton to the runner in front. Then he runs that leg of the race as fast as he can, and the same thing happens over there. The other, the other teammates looking back. They're getting closer and closer. He starts to jog. He starts to run, holds his hand back, and they pass that baton all the way to all four of the runners run the race, and they cross the finish line. Now, one thing that uh, I have seen happen before is when the baton is bobbled. You know what I'm talking about? They're running, they're running, they're running, and the guy reaches out to hand it off to the next guy. The next guy's hand doesn't catch it just right. I've never seen one drop personally, but I, I know what sure has happened, I'm sure. But they bobble that, or they, the, the, the next runner has to hold back his stride to, let the, to catch the baton. In those microseconds, that bobble causes the race. You know, you see those, those few seconds, that momentum that was, that was had is lost when they have to break their stride to hold back and get that baton and pass it on. Um, the Christian life is kind of like that. It's like a relay race in which 
Each generation is to pass on our faith to the next generation. And uh, as you think about passing on our faith, uh, it, is, um, it is awful and it's terrible when one generation bobbles and it's not passed off cleanly and it's, there's a stumble or there's some hesitation and uh, that causes a, a lot of problems. And um, I, one of my friends that has gone on to glory, he, he made the statement about our building outside. He said, uh, he was talking to someone and they said, well, you know, you and I won't ever get to use this, talking to my friend. And he goes, uh, I'm too old and you're too old. He goes, yeah, we are too old, but we can pass it off to the younger generation who can. Now, that's kind of what... I think a relay is, a race is like, and that's what I believe the Christian faith is like. You know, we are to pass on what we've learned to those that come behind us. And, you know, as a father, uh, I have the sacred responsibility to see my faith is passed down to my daughters, my granddaughter, and if I live long enough, my great-grandchildren. I have that sacred responsibility. Also, as a pastor, I have the responsibility to impart spiritual truth to you from God's Word so that when you are outside in the world living your life for Christ, you can pass on what you've learned. I also have that responsibility as a Christian. I must use every opportunity God gives me to spread the gospel, the good news. I've got to open my mouth and share what God has done on my behalf. So God will... Um, hold me accountable for that responsibility in my family, in the church, and out in the world. But this is what God will not do. God will not hold me accountable for the response of my daughters. He'll not hold me responsible for those that hear me preach the truth on Sunday. I'm not responsible for what you all do with the truth. I'm responsible to give the truth. I'm not responsible for those out in the world that I'll bump into that I share the gospel with and they don't receive it. I'm not responsible for them. I'm only responsible for doing my part. And as we think about doing our part, we will be absolutely accountable to God for not doing our part, not passing on the baton of faith, not sharing with others what has been done for us by Almighty God. And God will not accept our Flimsy excuses to not carry out the mission and pass that baton to the next generation. Now we have come to the end of Abraham's life in Hebrew, uh, Hebrews, in Genesis chapter 25. And at this point, uh, we've walked through all the adventures with him and he's uh, 175 years old. He's a very old man. He had lived in the promised land for 100 years. Sarah had been dead for 38 years. And after passing, Abraham married, it says, uh, Keturah. And she had six, he had six sons by her. And uh, that means that Abraham had eight sons in total. Six by Keturah, Ishmael by Hagar, and Isaac by Sarah. Now, there's no doubt that he loved all of those boys, and, but Isaac was the son of promise. And verses 1 through 6 makes that extremely clear. Look what it says there. It says, Abraham took another wife whose name was Keturah. She bore him, and I'm not going to attempt to say those names. But you can read those names or try as I would. But there's a list of six names there. And then it says, Abraham left everything he owned to Isaac. Did he leave some of it to Isaac? He left everything to Isaac. But while he was still living, he gave gifts to the sons of his concubines and sent them away from his son Isaac to the land of the east. Now, by giving them gifts, he did honor them. Uh, he showed his love for them. But by sending them away to the east, he indicated that Isaac and only Isaac was the son of promise. Now we come to the end of his life in verses 7 through 11. It says, Altogether, Abraham lived to be 175 years. Then Abraham breathed his last and died at a good old age. An old man and full of years, and he was gathered to his people. His sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah near Mar, uh, Mamar in the field of Ephron, son of Zor the Hithite, 
the field Abraham had brought from the Hittites, there Abraham was buried with his wife Sarah. After Abraham's death, God blessed his son Isaac. Now let's look at verse 7, kind of focus on that for a moment. At the end of his life, we see that it says he lived a good life. And then it goes on to say that he was an old man and he was full of years. I kind of like the way in which uh, that uh, uh, the NAS uh, phrase, it, New American Standard phrases it. It says that he died a ripe old age, an old man, and was satisfied with his life. Now, how many people can say that on their deathbeds? They've lived a good life and they're satisfied with the life in which they had lived. I would suggest not too many. Most folks at that end when it does come, they have regret, they have remorse, they have, well, I should have done this or I could have done that, and uh, regret of lost opportunities, remorse over foolish mistakes they made when they were young. And no doubt Abraham had his share of both of those. Yet as you look back over those 175 years, he was satisfied with the life he had lived. Now, we've walked through his life, uh, as we've read in Genesis, uh, and all the adventures that he had, and we have seen him go through all kinds of ups and downs. We've seen him have uh, frustration, uh, discouragement, uh, spiritual compromise. He had heard the voice of God. He had lied about things. He tried to help God out. He wept when he buried his wife. He had just lots of ups and downs. But as we've walked through his life with him, and we see those ups and downs, but even through even the bad moments, he is still a man of faith. Abraham never lost sight of the God who called him. And for that reason, I believe that reason alone is that he was satisfied with his life when he died. Now, Abraham, it says, was buried in a cave uh, he had purchased from the Ephraim, the Hittite. By burying uh, him alongside of his wife, Sarah, you know what his sons were saying? This is the passing of the baton. They were saying simply this. Uh, my translation would be, Dad lived his life in faith in God's promises. And when he died, he still believed God's promises. And we're burying him right here because one day this land will be his and it will be ours. There goes the passing of the baton. There goes the torch of truth passed down from one generation to the next. That's why in verse number 11, it says that God blessed Isaac. Now, one runner has finished the race. Another takes the baton and continues down the track. Here we go from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob to Joseph across all the generations to the very seat you're sitting in here at Bergen Baptist Church. The baton has been passed. It's been given to us. So let's look back at the life that we have studied Let's look back and kind of see what, we can, what we've learned. And the first thing is this, that Abraham, he believed God. You, you, can't, you can say a lot about Abraham, but you can't say less than that. He believed God. Um, he was a believer uh, in the God of the universe. Uh, there's no other explanation for his remarkable life that he lived. From the moment that God first spoke to him as a prosperous pagan in Ur to the moment where he breathed his last breath, he believed God. You know, today, in America that we live in, many people say they believe in God. A lot of folks make that, that, that statement, yeah, I believe in God. Well, think about Abraham... He believed God. His belief in God caused him to stake all that he was and all that he had on the truth that God had spoken to him. His lifestyle revealed his faith in God. He believed God. In the Old Testament, they look forward to the promise of the Messiah. In the New Testament and today, we live after God's provision. So we look back and then we look forward to the next great event on God's calendar, the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. But let's kind of think about this. What does it mean? What does it mean for someone to believe in God? To believe in God means that we agree with what God has said. Then we put it into practice. So let's kind of break down just a couple of scriptures. 
We would all say probably today, everybody in this room, everybody listening outside and online, yes, I believe in God. Do you realize what God's Word says to us? Uh, God speaks to us through His Word. We have it in our hands. You may have a digital copy, but we have a copy of God's Word. This is what God has said, and uh, we, we know what God said is true. And the, Jesus Christ said this in God's Word, Seek first God's kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Do we believe God? We may say we believe God, but are we putting that principle into practice? Do we put God first? Is his, is his voice the loudest in the room? Is he the one that we, when he speaks, we, when he says jump, we say how high? Is he the one that when he whispers to our ears, and that's, well, that doesn't make any sense in our world, but I've heard what God has said, and I'm going to do what God has said, putting God first. He'll work it out somehow, some way, according to his perfect plan. God also has told us that we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. You would say you believe that, I'm sure, but are you putting it into practice? Do you believe you really can do anything through Christ who will give you strength when God speaks to you? Do we, do we believe God just with our minds or do we believe in Him with our hearts? There, there's a huge difference there. And uh, would we say, would you say, would you, um, if Abraham, when God said, I want you to go to Ur, I want you, well, not, I want you to leave Ur and go to a place I want to show you. Uh, where's it at? I don't know. How far, how long it's going to take? I'm not sure. Uh, you just go, I'll show you where it's at. Now, we would say that he believed he heard from God. What would you have said about Abraham if he had heard from God like he did and he didn't leave Ur? Would you say he believed God then? I would say no. His lifestyle revealed that he believed God. He put it into action. He did something with what God had said. God had spoken. He staked his life, everything he had, and all that he would have on that fact. God has spoken to me. He's given me a promise, and I'm putting that, I'm marching in that direction. Do we believe God today? Does our lifestyle reveal that to the world that's watching us that we believe God? Abraham believed God, and you can see it all through his actions. Now, the second thing I, uh, we want to kind of summarize about Abraham, Abraham kept on believing. It wasn't like a U.K. ball player one and done. It was a, a daily thing. Now, he did fall. He did stumble some. You're right. We know that. But he kept believing. Abraham, 75 years old, when God appeared to him at Ur, promised to give him a son through whom the Lord would bless the world. And it's hard enough to believe that if you're eight in Abraham's shoes. But years passed. God had promised. More years passed. God had promised. Then a decade passes. God still promised. Then another, another decade, and still no promise. God gave the promise, but still no fulfillment of that promise. And finally, when he's 100 years old, Sarah at 90, Isaac is born. See, he kept on believing. When God had spoken, he, he, he had it in his heart, written in stone, God has said this. And he kept on believing. Now, if you want to, you can flip over to Romans chapter 4, or you can look on the screen, whichever you want to do. But Paul describes the magnitude of Abraham's faith. Look what he says there. It says, without weakening his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. That phrase, his body was as good as dead, no one is immune to the passage of time. Our bodies get older and just wear out. And... Uh, I've been intrigued. I don't know. I've talked to Libby about this, and I get intrigued. How many of you seen that Balance of Nature sh uh, commercials? Have you seen that? Oh, come on. Surely you've seen those commercials. 
uh, it's like the, almost like the fountain of youth, they say. And uh, I get intrigued by it. They, they take fruits and vegetables, they freeze dry them, they compact them, put them in a little capsule, and it's supposed to be just as good as eating it real. And I'm sure it's better than what the grocery stores may sell us. I'm sure, I would think. But it, they, they, they say you'll feel better, you get all this energy, all these things. But it may help. I don't think it's the fountain of youth uh, because uh, our bodies, when, we, when we're born, we start racing toward that time when we're going to die. Our bodies just wear out in time. And uh, when you think about uh, Abraham being 100, you think about Sarah being 90, their chances of having a child is slim to none, right? Slim to none. The odds are stacked against them. They're both well past childbearing years. In spite of all those odds stacked against them, Abraham kept on believing. He kept on believing. He had an unwavering faith. He did not give up. He kept on believing despite what the circumstances said. The circumstances screamed impossibility. But God had spoken. And he kept believing. Uh, I came across something this um, week, and I, I had to reference it two different, well, actually several different ways, more than two. I thought, that can't be true. That can't be true. Well, it is true. Because um, anything you read on the Internet, you have to be careful, right? Well, go home and Google the Chinese bamboo tree. It's insane. All right, here's, when you plant this, uh, you, when you plant it under the ground, it doesn't come out of the ground for five years. First year, nothing. Second year, nothing. Third year, nothing. Fourth year, nothing. Then the fifth year comes. I multi, multi, multi-check this fact. In the fifth year, it grows 90 feet in six weeks. Do you hear that? That is insane. So the question would be this, well, did it grow uh, 90 feet in five years or 90 feet in six weeks? Obviously, it took five years, right? It's just under the surface. We didn't see it, right? But I think that's the way God works. We, we may say, well, you know, I don't know. Uh, I don't see God do anything. I just, I don't know. <sighs> just be patient. Just be patient. Sometimes it seems like God's doing nothing. You ever felt that way? God's doing something. He's always at work in ways we can't see or understand, and His ways are perfect. Let's trust the process and trust Him and be patient. You know, I think God works His greatest works in our lives, uh, not overnight, but over years. Abraham kept on believing, even when the facts were stacked against him. Now, here's a statement. Every problem doesn't have to be solved today for God to be faithful. He'll do His work in His time. We just must be patient. Now, the third thing I want you to know about Abraham is that uh, we've talked about him stumbling, but he, he didn't fall. He wasn't a perfect man. We've kind of walked through his story. We've seen the times where he just did the wrong thing. Um, he was not perfect, far from it. He struggled with doubt. He struggled with fear, discouragement, deception, rebellion. He blamed others. He was selfish, um, just like everything we struggle with. He was just like we are. We've looked at his story. We've seen his life, and he stumbled. Twice he lied about his his wife, calling him his sister in order to uh, save his own skin. Both times he, he risked her purity and her own personal safety. Um, uh, we uh, have seen the, the sad story of the birth of, birth of Ishmael at Sarah's urging. He slept with the handmaiden of Sarah named Hagar from Egypt. No doubt he and Sarah rationalized that, um, trying to help God out to fulfill his promise. God doesn't need our help. He needs our obedience. And uh, to this very day, the world suffers through uh, one crisis after another in the Middle East because the sons of Isaac and the sons of Ishmael are still struggling today for control of the Holy Land. Now, if you remember back in chapter 15 of Genesis, it speaks of Abraham of being a righteous man. How do you call him righteous when we know all the stuff that he did wrong? 
We call him righteous because God's word calls him righteous in chapter 15. But secondly, we call him righteous because uh, it's crucial that we look at the direction someone's taking. That makes all the difference in the world. Now, let me make a statement or two. It's better to be one foot from hell leaning toward heaven than to be one foot from heaven leaning toward hell. Direction means a lot. For all his weaknesses, his stumbles, Abraham's heart is still fixed upon God. That's why he is called the friend of God. The highest compliment I believe you could find in Scripture, he was a, a friend of God. Now let me ask you a question about your friends. Do your friends ever disappoint you? Raise your hand. Yep, friends disappoint us. Are they still our friends? Of course. Why is that? Well, we know deep down that they're still committed to us. They're really still our friends. And that's, I think, precisely how God looked at Abraham. And here's the truth. Salvation is forever. Why is that? Because salvation rests on God's character, not mine. Salvation is not based on my performance, but Christ's performance on the cross. Those who God saves, he saves forever. Eternal life begins the very moment, uh, doesn't begin when you die. It begins the very moment you believe. Those who are born again cannot be unborn any more than a baby can return to its mother's womb. I want to read to you uh, Proverbs, or Psalms first. Psalms 37, it's on the screen, it says... The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. He delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. For the Lord upholds him with his hand. Then in Proverbs chapter 24 it says, Though a righteous man falls seven times, he rises again. Abraham stumbled. He fell. But each time as we look through his life and his adventures, he always got up. And that's what a righteous man does. Now we know a pig will get into the mud and just lay there and wall around in it, right? That's what a pig does. That's not what a righteous man does. Abraham lived and he died by faith. He never saw the fulfillment of all that God had promised him, but he believed someday it would all come true. Now the last thing I want to share with you about Abraham is Abraham never took his eyes off heaven. Uh, I'm not sure when I found this out. It's a couple years ago, maybe longer than that. Um, you know the blue building uptown here in Bergen, the blue building? You can't, you can't miss it, the blue building. Right across from the blue building, there's that lot like a garden now, I think it is, and there's a building back behind it, a two-story like an apartment or something. You know, that's where the Bergen Baptist Church used to sit. I found that out years ago, and I thought, well, that's interesting. And, and uh, the members of the church thought, well, we, we, we live down there to this down, down there across from the school. That's our mission field. Let's, let's go there. And the old church is not there any longer. People who moved to our town like me have no idea that's where the church used to be. They have no idea there was a building there and a pulpit that used to proclaim the truth. There's no, um, I guess you would say, um, markings or sign out there. This is where the Bergen Baptist Church used to be. Now, I've said that to say this. Everything that a man will build will one day crumble in a road. Everything. But notice, if you read, as we saw at the very beginning in Hebrews, how the writer summarizes the life of Abraham. It says in verse 11, verse 8, and following again, By faith, Abraham... When called to go to a place, he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went. Even though he did not know where he was going, by faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign land. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to a city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. In verse 8, he obeyed God's call. Verse 9, he lived in tents. Verse number 10, he was looking for a city with foundations. 
And I think verse 10 is, is, uh, is, is the key. It says, looking for a city with foundations who architect and builder is God. He was looking forward to heaven as he was journeying around the sun. Uh, when you think about his life that we have been able to study and to, to learn from, what an adventure it's been. And one thing I want you to think about, he was satisfied with the life that he lived. As he looked back, he was satisfied. He had no regrets. He had no remorse. He had hard times. He did the wrong things. But he, he was leaning in a direction. He was going toward that direction, that promise that God had made. He was satisfied with his life. Now, here is the question that matters the most to you for this moment. Are you satisfied with your life? Are you satisfied in the direction that you're leaning? Are you satisfied or do you look right now and say, oh, I've got some regrets. I've got some remorse right now. I, you know, I need to do that. I need to do this. I shouldn't be doing this. What Do you have regrets or remorse? Abraham looked back and he says, you know, I don't. He believed God. Now, what has God said to us? What, what's God said to you? In general, he said to all of us, in Ephesians, it tells us that uh, we were born in sin. We were dead in our trespasses and sins, it says directly in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. All of us, dead in our trespasses and sins. Everyone's guilty. We're all in the same boat. But on top of that, it also says in John chapter 3, a, a very favorite verse, you probably know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Dead in our trespasses and sins, God sent his son to die on a cross. The Bible says that while we were yet sinners, dead in our sin, Christ died for us. He was buried. He arose again that third day. We celebrate that every Easter. And it says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Jesus said this, talking about the commitment that, is, that should be evidenced in our lives, the lifestyle. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. So the question I have for this moment, have you been born again? Are you sure? Abraham believed God. He kept believing God. He didn't give up. He knew that God was on the move and God was going to take care of this. God, when he, God spoke the promise, it was going to happen. And he looked forward to that. All the odds were against him, circumstances. He kept believing. Maybe you're hearing you say these words, I've stumbled. I've bobbled that handoff, that baton that's been passed to me. I've been stumbling and kind of going all over the every, every which direction. It's time to get back on track. What direction is your life leaning right now? Is your heart fixed upon God? Are you looking toward that heavenly home? Abraham didn't take his eyes off heaven. He was looking forward to that city who had foundations, whose builder and architect were God. Maybe you have some unfinished business today. God is speaking to you about that right now. Whatever it may be. It could be believer's baptism. It may be church membership. It may be something he wants you to say, do specifically today or this week or some type of ministry to get involved with. He's speaking. Do we believe? Do we really believe that he's speaking? I'm going to pray and Tony's going to come lead us in a song that I've sung many, many times, but it is so appropriate, just as I am. That's how we come to God. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for 
the life and the adventure that we've been able to study over the last several, several weeks. And Lord, today, as we kind of look back in summary of the life of Abraham, Lord, we see where he believed God and his lifestyle proved it. He didn't just believe this day. He kept on believing. We're grateful that we, it's recorded in Scripture that he did stumble, but he didn't fall. He kept getting up. Lord, if there's someone here who's just fallen and they've just almost wanted to give up, and Lord, I pray you give them the strength today to get up. Lord, help us to realize we're here just for a short time. One day in Christ, we'll be in that place that you are preparing for those who believe, those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Lord, we ask now that you would, as you have spoken, that we would believe and we would be receptive and we would respond. We thank you, God, for this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together. What a blessing it is to come to the Lord. Amen? It is a blessing.